exhume a body. It's a hard thing to go through, having a loved one dug up. This is the moment the murderous activities of Britain's biggest serial killer were unearthed. That son of a gun killed my father on Christmas Eve. In the coming weeks, the hush of night was to be repeatedly broken by exhumation after exhumation. We used to joke about it because we used to say, she's always down there and I bet he's got fed up with her and bumped her off. And now... Over the coming months, detectives were to investigate the deaths of nearly 150 patients of Dr Fred Shipman. How far does this go? How deep is it? How many people have been murdered by Dr Shipman? I don't think that there'll ever be an answer to that question. The only person that knows is not talking to us. Today, as the 53-year-old doctor who used his caring manner as a cover for murder was led away to spend the rest of his life behind bars, two major questions are being asked. Why and how did he literally get away with murder for so long? For the first time, the true extent of his ruthless killing spree can be revealed. How five patients died inside his surgery. How he killed eight patients in one month. How he murdered six patients in one street. How, to obtain the means to kill, he turned a patient into a drug addict. How he then killed that patient's father when he asked too many questions about his son's treatment how he murdered another patient he believed had left him a small fortune. And tonight we can reveal that the man dubbed Dr. Death will, in the next few days, be charged with at least 18 more murders, making him one of the world's most prolific serial killers. A senior detective lights candles to the memory of 15 murder victims of Dr. Harold Frederick Shipman. Stan Edgerton was a detective for 30 years, but nothing during his long service could prepare him for the enormity of his final case. He still finds it difficult to come to terms with. The exhumations created numerous emotions, and the one that sticks in my mind more than any, is intrusion. Not only were we intruding into death, we were intruding into the grief of the families. Only months away from retirement, Inspector Edgerton was asked to investigate what appeared to be a routine case, never envisaging that it would lead to him exhuming 12 bodies and arresting and charging a mass murderer. This was a case of forgery and attempting to obtain monies by deception. Never at the beginning of the investigation did I ever envisage that I'd be dealing with not only one murder investigation, but a number of murder investigations. Inspector Edgerton had been asked to look into the will of Kathleen Grundy, who died suddenly on June the 24th, 1998, at her home in Joel Lane, Hyde on the outskirts of Manchester. Mrs Grundy, a former mayoress of Hyde, was well known about the town as a sprightly 81-year-old, involved in a host of social activities. She was highly respected in the area. She spent all her spare time working on behalf of other people. She ran a luncheon club two or three days a week. She worked to help their aged. She did the banking for them. She was a remarkable woman. Two days before she died, a local firm of solicitors received a crudely typed will purporting to be from Mrs Grundy, who they had never dealt with before. On a standard post office form, Mrs Grundy's whole £300,000 estate was bequeathed to her doctor, Fred Shipman. Eight days later, Hamilton's received a letter informing them of Mrs Grundy's death. They contacted her daughter, Angela Woodruff, in Leamington Spa. 
she realised that there must be something wrong because she is a solicitor in her own right and had in fact got a mother's will in her possession that had been made some 10 years prior to her death. Confused and alarmed, Mrs Woodruff turned private detective and, armed with a copy of the shipman will, she travelled to Hyde to track down the two people who had allegedly witnessed it. One of the witnesses was Paul Spencer. Mrs Woodruff soon discovered how devious Shipman had been and how he tricked her mother. Uh, sat in Dr Shipman's surgery. Uh, there was maybe six or seven other people in the surgery. Dr Shipman popped his head round his door and asked whether myself and another girl that was in the surgery with a pram wouldn't mind witnessing a document. So, thinking nothing of it, I stood up, went into the room. Uh, there's an old lady sat in the room. I now know that lady to be Mrs Grundy. Um, the doctor passed me um, a folded over document, um, which he said, as, as he passed it, he asked Mrs Grundy whether or not she was okay with it or something along the lines of, um, are you sure about this, is this okay? Um, he indicated where I was to sign the document. The document was folded over so I couldn't read it. I couldn't see what was on the document. And being in the doctor's surgery, I didn't dream of asking. Um, I signed my name. Mrs Grundy's signature was already on the document. Um, I, I believed I was signing a medical form. I didn't for a minute believe I was signing a will. I would have expected to sign wills in solicitors' offices, not in doctor's surgeries. Mrs Grundy believed she was signing an authorisation, giving her approval to take part in a survey on ageing for Manchester University. Shipman's greed was his undoing. Mrs Woodruff went to the police in her hometown of Leamington Spa, who referred her complaint to the Greater Manchester Force. The file dropped on Inspector Edgerton's desk. Having spoken to Angela Woodruff, the deceased daughter, we realised that we were opening a can of worms and uh, we didn't know at that stage how far it was going to go. Although it's very, very fair to say I still didn't think at this stage that I was looking at a murder inquiry. Returning to Hyde from seeing Mrs Woodruff, Mr Edgerton realised that this was not the first time the police had shown an interest in Dr Shipman. Four months earlier, after a worried GP had expressed concerns about the high number of deaths among Shipman's patients, a secret police inquiry was ordered by the local coroner, John Pollard. Originally, I was approached by uh, a local general practitioner in the Hyde area, uh, and she felt that she had been signing rather more second cremation certificates than would normally be the case, where the first signature was that of Dr. Shipman. Uh, and on the basis of that, she then telephoned me and asked me to look into the matter to make sure that everything was as it should be. There were two possible explanations for that. One was that something untoward was happening, or the other explanation was that Dr Shipman was just a very, very conscientious GP and happened to be in attendance with a lot of patients shortly after they died at their home address. But the concerned doctor was not the only person to notice the abnormal number of deaths being certified by Shipman. Undertaker Debbie Bambroff was another. The well-respected family firm Frank Massey & Son is the largest independent funeral directors in Hyde. We were concerned that there were too many deaths from one surgery, especially when that surgery only had one doctor. Most of the deaths seemed to fit into a pattern, usually ladies, nearly always ladies. Um, never anyone that had been ill, as in terminally ill. It seems strange that nearly all the people that had died were dressed. Now if somebody's ill, they're generally usually in bed with the nightwear on, but that was never the case. They were always fully dressed as if they'd just come back from shopping. It was very rare that anyone actually died in bed. It was usually sat up in a chair in the living room. Things just didn't add up. We talked about it as a family. Um, the circumstances of the deaths. Debbie came to me one day and just said she was concerned with all this, these sudden deaths which was Dr Shipman was signing the forms for. 
and I sort of said there's nothing to worry about it's just that he's all patience and I think she had a word with another doctor about it and then she she's had another word with me this was a couple of months later something like that so with that I thought I'd go down and have a word with Dr Shipman. When my father went to see Dr Shipman about the concerns that we had I think it took a lot of courage to do that it, it was ridiculous. We trust a man, trust a doctor, and for us to make ac accusations, assumptions, to have concerns about a doctor maybe murdering people because that's what it is. I was the last one in, in the surgery at the time. Said to me, uh, yes, come on in. Went in his surgery. I told him then it was a bit, a bit well, rather embarrassing what I'd come for. Uh, and I explained to him that both myself and my daughter were a bit concerned with some of these deaths. And he didn't show any signs of shock, surprise, anything at all. He just said, oh, I'll show you. He got his book out, which is the register that he gives, keeps a copy of the, the certificate that he's given to a, a next of kin, to a deceased person, and showed me on there. And he said, anybody can come and look at this book that wishes to. Our minds had been put at ease, maybe not fully, but had been put at ease by various people in authority that there was nothing untoward. We had a call off a police constable. The constable just said to us, what it boils down to is he's got a vast uh, amount of patients, elderly patients, and he's such a caring doctor that it's just he gets more deaths than anybody else. And with that, I was quite satisfied. The police carried out a full investigation at that stage based upon the instructions that I gave to them. Uh, I was quite satisfied with the in, uh, inquiry that they made, but it, it led to nothing. They, they couldn't see anything that was wrong at that time. Mr Pollard's instructions that Shipman was not to be made aware of any inquiries or their source prevented police carrying out a full investigation. I would carry on going to see my doctor, Dr Shipman, as normal. And the longer I sat in his room, the more I thought how ridiculous these, these suspicions and concerns had been. It was impossible to think that my doctor, who I trusted in and confided in, could be doing something so terrible. Aware from Debbie's father's visit that his murderous activities had aroused suspicions, did Shipman panic and hurriedly decide to forge Mrs Grundy's will? to provide him with the funds to flee. Inspector Edgerton thinks not. It's been suggested from a number of sources that one of the reasons why he perhaps forged the will as he did was that he, he thought that his world was collapsing around him. I personally don't go along with that view at all. It's my firm belief that uh, he thought he was so invincible, so super intelligent, that um, he thought that he, the police weren't aware of what was going on. Following the coroner's inquiry, Shipman's belief that he could fool anyone led him to commit three more murders, the last being Mrs Grundy. The crude forging of her will was the act of supreme arrogance that was to be his downfall. And I think it's part of this arrogance. I've got away with this for the length of time that I have. Nobody's queried me about it, nobody's questioned me about it. I might as well make a few bob out of this. It may well have been his thoughts. And he's pr proceeded to put together that will, which, when you look at it, uh, is just a, um, an amateurish attempt. The inquiry was beginning to take off at a rapid rate of knots and I've got to say that the detective superintendent Bernard Postles took hold of things then and said well let's sit down and let's go through this piece by piece and let's assimilate exactly what we've got. It must have made him sit up sharply in his chair when a detective inspector suddenly talking about exhumation of bodies to give him his due, it, it didn't take him long to realise and grasp that what I was telling him was probably the only direction that we could go in. In the dead of night, 
A month after Mrs Grundy was buried at Hyde Chapel, Inspector Edgerton was in charge of exhuming her body. The actual logistics of doing an exhumation is a mammoth operation. There are so many things to, have to consider uh, to keep the, the decency of the matter, to show respect and reverence to the deceased remains. There was the family that had to be considered. We had to make sure that we'd identified the correct grave. We had to take soil samples, make sure that the mortuary were put on notice because we were going to have a post-mortem. It's a strange feeling to be stood there at three o'clock in the morning in the pitch dark um, with a team of men that were going to dig up a body. Being the senior officer at the exhumations, I was also conscious of the welfare of all the staff that were there. Even though some of them were not police officers, they, they were civilian members of support staff. I was conscious of their feelings as well. At the same time as Mrs Grundy was being exhumed, Stan Edgerton had a team of detectives raid Shipman's home and surgery, looking for the typewriter and other evidence used to forge the will. Dr Shipman was well aware of what we were looking for and in fact produced the typewriter which is a, a portable type typewriter. It, it didn't look a very expensive uh, machine but he, he produced it from a cupboard in the surgery. The typewriter, the forged will and samples taken from Mrs Grundy's liver and muscle tissue were sent to the Forensic Science Laboratory at Chorley for analysis. Experts quickly established that Shipman's typewriter had been used to forge the will and the letter. I'm, I'm me. Oh, you might. But while Inspector Edgerton waited for Mrs Grundy's post-mortem results, he was approached by a local taxi driver who'd built up his own dossier of suspicions against Shipman, going back many years. Perhaps two dozen of my customers passed away in very, very similar circumstances. All of them Dr Shipman's patients. But people were having a call from the doctor and within a couple of hours of him visiting them, they were passing away. John was talked out of going to the police by his wife, worried about wrongly accusing a well-respected doctor of murder. But when the investigation into Kathleen Grundy's death started, he decided it was time to act. When I approached Mr Edgerton after Kathleen Grundy's death, and I told him that I'd compiled a list of my customers who died in uh, similar circumstances to Kathleen, going back six years, he was shocked. When I questioned him and I looked into it, it was plainly evident to me that we were going to have to examine the deaths of a number of other people. Gut reaction set in and when that was discussed by the senior management teams we then decided that yes we'd have to look at further exhumations. Harold Frederick Shipman was born in Nottingham in January 1946. His early years were spent at this house in Longmead Drive his father, also Harold Frederick, was a long-distance lorry driver. His mother, Vera, was ill for many years, slowly dying of cancer. Fred, the middle one of three children, was the clever one of the family. He passed his 11-plus to the local grammar school, High Pavement. Although never a high flyer and in the sea stream, Shipman was respected by the other boys for his sporting prowess on the athletics track and the rugby field. Seen here securing the ball in a line-out in some rare footage of a school match, Shipman is well remembered by former schoolmates. I was a friend of Fred. We were in the same year as one another. Uh, we played rugby together. He was a very, very able sportsman and notable for his rugby and also for his athletics. Fred um, was a very quiet, uh, calm individual until he got on the rugby field and then he was quite a fiery character. But as an individual off the field, uh, very easygoing and quiet young man. 
Fred passed five O-level GCEs and went into the sixth form, only for disaster to strike. His mother died. Fred was just 17. Vera Shipman had fought a long and brave battle against cancer with ever-increasing daily injections of morphine. Some believe this early introduction to morphine and death had a lasting effect on young Fred. His reaction at the time was considered bizarre. It must have been a Monday morning that um, we met up and we, we were walking back to school. And as you do, you know, what did you do at the weekend? And uh, I told him what I'd done at the weekend and I asked him what he'd done. And he said, oh, my mum died. I said, oh, God, what did you do? You know, it must have been awful. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, I went for a run. But uh, he went on to say that he'd, he'd actually run till I think he said two o'clock in the morning or something and in the pouring rain. After his mother's death, Shipman decided to become a doctor. He spent the next six years as a medical student here at Leeds University. In his first year, he met his wife, Primrose Oxterby, then a pretty 17-year-old window dresser. Within months, Prim was pregnant with Sarah, the first of their four children, and much against her parents' wishes, they were quietly married. After a couple of years training as a houseman, Shipman joined a group GP practice in the Yorkshire mill town of Todmorden in the mid-1970s. He's remembered fondly for his enthusiasm. It started with a keen young man coming with the latest ideas and techniques with a great deal of enthusiasm and very much hands-on putting it into practice and encouraging us all to do the same thing and I think we all benefited from his sojourn with us. Despite his popularity Fred had problems he started having mysterious blackouts. Dr Grieve, Shipman's senior partner at the time, remembers being called to Fred's home after he collapsed in the bath. He had one or two blackouts and was uh, finally diagnosed by a consultant as having epilepsy and being unable to drive a car. So his wife volunteered to fill in this so that he could continue to work, which he did very efficiently. But Fred Shipman hadn't told his colleagues the truth. He was a drug addict with a huge dependency on pethidine, a painkiller used in childbirth. I mean, there wasn't any great disaster or anything. It was just, uh, he, he, he could no longer, he was a sick doctor, there he had to go. In February 1976, Harold Frederick Shipman stood in the dock at Halifax Magistrates Court and admitted eight charges of obtaining drugs by deception and asked for 74 other offences to be taken into account. He was fined a total of £600. The court heard he obtained the highly addictive drug by over-prescribing for patients at a local nursing home and by forging prescriptions. Shipman agreed to undergo treatment at the renowned Retreat Hospital in York. Although the General Medical Council was notified, Shipman was not struck off. In 1979, free of his addiction, he applied to join a group practice in Hyde, a small Cheshire market town with a population of 60,000. At his interview, the six partners were impressed by Shipman, particularly his honesty that he had been addicted to pethidine. They decided to give him a second chance. Fred Shipman threw himself into local community life both as a hard-working doctor and as a member of local organisations like the St John Ambulance Brigade, the Scouts and as a local school governor. He soon became so popular that he had a long waiting list of people wanting to join his panel. But in 1991, Shipman delivered a bombshell to his partners. 
After almost 12 years, he was leaving to go it alone in a single-handed practice and glibly announced he was taking his 3,000 patients with him. The parting was acrimonious, but Shipman didn't care. He'd carefully planned the move for months and within weeks opened just a few yards away in a converted shop in Market Street. Now, unsupervised, he could enjoy his secret self-indulgence, murder. And as a single-handed general practitioner, he would show them, he would show how good he was and how he could help people, and he would do things his own way. And without the breaks of working in a partnership, um, of the constraints that daily testing yourself against colleagues uh, has on one, um, perhaps that was one of the factors that led to him going off the rails. How seriously Shipman had gone off the rails only became clear when the toxicology results came back from the Forensic Science Laboratory. I'm still amazed that the results that we got back from the forensic examination were as they were. I didn't expect that for one minute. The death certificate issued by Shipman recorded Kathleen Grundy had died of old age. The truth was she'd been killed by a massive dose of morphine. Such an amount that the forensic scientist had no doubt that uh, death would have occurred in quite a short time. She had been to visit him on the previous day to her death at around about four o'clock and he made an appointment with her to go and take a blood sample the following morning. He's made an appointment to kill her. When questioned, Shipman's incredible claim was that Mrs Grundy, at 81, was a heroin addict. What had started as a simple fraud investigation was now a full-scale murder inquiry. Information flooded in from anxious callers to special helplines and detectives began to notice a pattern to the deaths. The number of people that died at home, single women living on their own, dying within an hour or so of seeing Dr Shipman, dying sat in a chair, dressed in the day clothes, so many of them going to the surgery and dying in the surgery. It just stretched logic to uh, something that you could not believe. And right away, we knew that we were probably dealing with one of the biggest murder investigations that one could imagine. But it was Shipman's fascination with computers that was to provide another major breakthrough for the inquiry team and help convict him. Detectives examined the deaths of nearly 150 of his patients. Checks of some of the computerised records of some of the deceased patients revealed that visits that they'd made to the surgery had been obliterated. Things that had been written in about the patient's health had been taken out and we can only surmise that that was done because it didn't uh, correspond with what was on the death certificate. On other occasions, visits appeared on the patient's record when in fact we believed that no visit was made to the surgery. It was as though he was building up a history that would tie in with the medical records that he wrote onto the death certificate. He was certainly uh, covering up his tracks for something. And police computer experts soon discovered what it was. Shipman was altering patient records to conceal his crimes. And on occasion, to save time, he recorded their deaths before he killed them. The number of deaths towards the end were, were increasing at such a rapid rate that I, I sometimes wonder whether he'd have time to prepare a lot of what he was doing. And this was why he was changing the medical records round about the time the person died shortly afterwards. And in fact, in one case, he was altering the records before a body was even found. What we decided to do was to go back over a period of 12 months 
and ascertain how many people had died and how many death certificates that Dr. Shipman had written. In a 12 month period, there were some 36 deaths. One of the things that jumped out at us was that never had there been a post-mortem. We also realized that the number of deaths that he had in a 12 month period was two and a half times more than uh, the average. An incident room had been set up at Ashton Underline Police Station, manned by 56 hand-picked detectives. Special flow charts were designed, showing when, where, how and under what circumstances patients had died in the previous five years. Our investigations established that on many, many occasions Dr Shipman had seen them on the day that they died. In a lot of cases he'd seen them within, if not an hour, certainly a couple of hours of death. And again, that itself become illogical. Alice Kitchen was one of those illogical cases, where Shipman had visited shortly before she died. But there was something unusual which bothered her family. All the family were very surprised and wondered why she was sat where she was on the settee, because she never sits there. She always sits in a chair where she can see out the window, and as soon as anybody pulls up, she's got the door open ready for them before they've got to the door. She always sits there, and where she was found on the settee, she had her back to the window. And um, I do know that one neighbour that was interviewed was asked if she saw Dr Shipman coming or going, and she said that um, he was coming out as she was going in her house and that she thought it was unusual that my mother was sat on the settee. She could see the back of her, uh, and she said that she never sits there and that she always sees everybody to the door, and she didn't see him to the door. She thought that was odd. And Dr Shipman never spoke to her and never said, she's not well, will you sit with her or anything like that. Alice Kitchen may have died in an unusual chair at home, but five of Dr Shipman's patients died in an even more unlikely place, his surgery. We spoke to a number of doctors and said, well, you know, how many times have you ever had a patient die in the surgery? And most doctors look aghast. They said, well, it never happens. One of those who died in his surgery was 72-year-old Edith Brady, a long-term patient of Fred Shipman. Edith, who loved a social occasion, was the principal guest at the family's Christmas party a few months before her death. He told me that um, she'd gone in the back room to lay down and he just went in and found her dead. And um, that he worked on her and, and nothing could be done. So... We spent some time when I gave her a kiss and I noticed how tidy she was and um, they said it was her heart and we just accepted that that's what it was. And I was just glad that she didn't have to have a post-mortem because I didn't want to be messed about. I just said, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad she was there and he said, well, she's not the first one to die. He had another lady that died in here who said that at the time. And I was glad, because that's the place she liked to be. She liked Dr Shipman. We used to joke about it, because we used to say, she's always down there, and I bet he's got fed up with her and bumped her off. And now, now when I think about it, it's unbelievable. Detectives were also noticing other disturbing facts. That Shipman had been present when six of his patients died in one street, in an 18-month period, and that in one month, eight women patients died mysteriously. We saw that on one occasion, in a particular month, there were eight people died, which is an average of two a week. And whenever we spoke to other people in the medical profession, that they stood back in amazement. For a second time, Hyde was overshadowed by mass murder. In the mid-1960s, it was home to Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, the Moore's murderers. Now it was home to Fred Shipman, and as the new investigation grew, once again the population faced the horror of killing. Attending the exhumations of his parishioners, Father Dennis Marr found himself a central figure. The community were in shock. 
would be a good way of, of describing it, in shock. They just couldn't believe this was happening. And they didn't want to believe it. It's all a bad dream. On top of this feeling of shock and disbelief and a shattering of trust, people also had a sense of guilt. They had suspicions, but didn't voice them or speak of them for a number of reasons, because at the time they didn't want to upset other members of the family. But a more common factor, who would have believed me anyhow if I said this to any, anybody? Father Dennis vividly remembers Shipman's dismissive manner towards the grieving family of Winnie Meller, only hours after he'd murdered her. Her daughters were in deep shock. I was very shocked myself and very saddened because I was quite fond of Wynne. She was a lovely person. And the doctor came in in a very brusque manner and um, said something along the lines of, you were aware your, your mother had a heart condition. I could see the look of surprise in the daughter's faces. He followed this up by saying she wouldn't accept treatment and she wouldn't go to the hospital. The daughters now were kind of looking in amazement at him. He immediately followed this up by saying, do you have an undertaker? And at this stage I intervened and said, well, the woman has just died and I, I, um, I think I, we just leave that at the moment. He then uh, followed on saying, and by the way, there's no problem um, with issuing a death certificate. I can do, I can do that. He just pop down to the surgery. And that was it. He was gone. Knowing what I know now, I can certainly say he was making sure that nothing would go wrong and that there would be no element of blame in any way attached to him or any suspicion whatsoever. When detectives searched Shipman's home, they found a large number of rings and other jewellery stuffed into a bag in the garage. This habit of petty theft from his victims provoked feuds within their families. Various members of the family being questioned as to who got there first and who, who found mum first and so on, and this leading to a kind of suspicions all around the place. I do know also from one family that um, one of the women on the day of her death had been to collect her pension, which would have been in the region of, um, I suppose, 70, 80 pounds. She certainly didn't um, spend all that that afternoon, but no, um, money being found in her purse um, after she died. It may never be known how often Shipman emptied the purses of his victims for paltry sums, but from one of them he expected to inherit £60,000. Bianca Pomfret was the youngest of Shipman's victims, only 49 when he killed her. Divorced and suffering from manic depression, Mrs. Pomfret had come to depend on Dr. Shipman. In a nutshell, she thought the world of him to the extent that uh, several years ago we were contemplating moving houses. And, and one of the reasons why we didn't move is, is she stressed that, that she would have preferred to have stayed in Thameside and under Dr. Shipman. Now, I think if somebody puts the relationship that they've got with the doctor above moving on to a new form of life, it's got to be quite a close link. So much so that she informed me several months before her death that, that she was actually leaving all the monies and properties to him in a will. She also stated that she'd told Dr Shipman this. Fortunately, I convinced her that the proper thing to do would be to leave her monies and properties to the grandchildren. I can't speculate as to why Shipman murdered Bianca. 
whether or not it was because of the fact that he thought he was going to benefit financially or maybe even if she had informed him he realised he'd been cut out of her will. I, I don't know. Bianca Pomfret was the fourth victim to be exhumed. In the following month, police opened eight more graves and removed the bodies for examination. Each body contained varying high levels of morphine. But even without a body, police were able to charge Shipman with the murders of six patients who'd been cremated. So incriminating was the computer and other circumstantial evidence. The evidence that we were being presented with in relation to those bodies where they, they had been cremated was so overwhelming as far as we were concerned that we could not just put it to one side. By now it was becoming obvious to police that Shipman arrogantly believed he'd created the perfect murder and had got away with it for years. He believed that he was able to face this thing out, that people didn't have uh, a superior enough intellect to break down and establish the facts of what had gone on here. When he was arrested, detectives like Stan Edgerton saw that arrogance at first hand. During the course of questioning, his arrogance was to the fore all the time. Whenever I spoke to him, it was plainly obvious that um, he thought I was beneath him and that uh, he gave a distinct impression that it should be at least a superintendent that was talking to him and dealing with him. And he made that plainly obvious that uh, I wasn't uh, his intellectual equal. I think that he, he came in to be interviewed on, uh, on the first occasion on the 7th of September. And having walked in through the door, he expected to be walking out around about five o'clock in the evening. And I think he was surprised when he was charged with murder. You could see his demeanour change, his voice changed. The arrogance was the first thing to go. And then, to a certain extent, he tried then to control the interview by changing the subject or trying to indicate to the interviewing officers that they didn't understand. And as we went further into the interviews and we put the forensic evidence towards him, the morphine in the body, he could not in any way explain that. The medical records, um, he couldn't explain again why they'd been changed. Eventually, he got more and more distressed and at one stage actually broke down. But what really shocked hardened detectives like Inspector Edgerton was the ruthless and cynical lengths Shipman went to to obtain his weapon to kill, the morphine. Two years ago, former airline pilot Jim King was wrongly diagnosed with cancer, a week after marrying his American wife Debbie. After undergoing three months of painful chemotherapy, Shipman was told he'd never had cancer but Shipman failed to pass on the good news. Instead, Shipman continued to prescribe Jim massive amounts of morphine in order to maintain a regular supply of his murder weapon. He was told on three separate occasions by consultants from different hospitals that I had not had cancer, I had never had cancer, but he still proceeded to do this. I know now why he, why he did this, because the more patients that you have are uh, terminally ill, the more morphine that you can have in your stock. If you're in general medical practice and you are caring for terminal patients at home, sooner or later you can acquire, you can guarantee that you will acquire uh, heroin which has been unused and which uh, you basically do not have to account for. Jim's father, a Shipman patient, was so concerned about his son's health that he started asking questions. Too many for Shipman's liking, and the doctor killed him. My father had been down to the surgery a few times to ask Dr Shipman what was going on with my case, because he could see me deteriorating rapidly with the amount of morphine I was using. I mean, that son of a gun 
kill my father on Christmas Eve of all the days to, I mean, to do this. And I believe he did that because he, he needed to stop this man complaining at that time. Because the last thing he needed was to have complaints, knowing that what we know now, the last thing he needed is for somebody to come forward and say, what the hell's going on here? And then all this lot would have come out. And you know, it's a shame it hadn't come out because after he killed my father, he proceeded to kill four or five other, other people. And Shipman would almost certainly still be killing today, but for his amateurish attempt to forge Mrs Grundy's will. But the big question still remains. Why did a doctor dedicated to saving life murder his patients? Those close to the case have their own theories. He might get a kick out of being in control and the ultimate power is the power over life and death. I can't think of anything else that could explain it. Why he did it I think is simply a matter of convenience, uh, that it was more convenient perhaps to get rid of a patient who was an awkward patient uh, by killing her than uh, by trying to persuade the family practitioner committee to transfer her to another general practitioner. It's horrendous, isn't it, to think of that, that that could happen, but it clearly did. I think that a significant number of the people that Dr. Shipman killed, he may have killed quite simply because he did not wish to continue caring for them for whatever reason. <laughs>